All right, in the last video, we introduced the idea of sketching for logo design and finding outside inspiration. I introduced the theme for this semester, which is science and technology. And you can find all of this under assignments. And I have these Google slides for logo design and creation basics. And these are a lot of good resources as we transition into understanding designing vectors over just compositing raster pixel based images. So there's a great video that a past student made explaining the difference between vectors and, and raster, but here they are in slides. So we are designing logos. We're going to use vector format for that because it perfectly suits what the digital format of vectors do best. Vectors give you perfectly sharp and clean print resolution and edges at any size. So it's the difference here. Like this is a circle. These are all raster images, right? But this is a circle at 600 by 600 pixels. And it looks pretty smooth. But if you were to zoom in on that edge, because it's made of pixels, you would eventually see 600 by 600 pixels. You would see the little stair steps because curves had to be, have to be made with square pixels if it's a raster image. So the lower resolution it gets, the less and less it looks like a, a circle and the, the more distorted it gets. Whereas with a vector, vector you can zoom in on and it will always be as perfectly clean as something that's the highest resolution. So let's take this little snippet from a sports logo. If it's a vector, you could just take that tooth and zoom in on it and print it the size of a building and it would be perfectly clean. But if it's raster, even a high resolution raster at 300 uh, pixels per inch or higher, as soon as you zoom in on it, it's gonna start to lose its edges. And then when, you get to below 300, which is below print resolution, you start to really see those pixel degradations. So how do you think about vector design? It's ideal for a single color or simple flat color with hard edges. So think of things like street signs. Think of things like the emblems for the different events at the Olympics. These are always done as vector graphics. We are gonna design our logos as a black shape, like a cutout black shape. It's not even black and white, it's just black. And then we're gonna be able to add color variations to that, right? So it needs to work as just a black cutout. So as you're sketching, you wanna think about what is the solid black shape that this is going to result in. So try to get away from just outlines. So here, side by side, we have an illustration. This uses an, a vector-based program called Adobe Illustrator. Or you can use vector.com as well if you're just doing it remotely and you don't have the Adobe software. But it creates everything cleanly. So each shape we're looking at here is its own separate vector path. It's kind of like a layer. So if it's a color, like the, the light pink, that's one vector path. If it's a, a color that's gradated, that's a separate vector path. And this gray line is actually a vector shape. It has an inside edge and an outside edge. Notice how the line tapers from thick to thin. It's all just like cutting it out with a blade. To do this with pixels, you can see the pixels that would be involved. And it doesn't have the same control where Things can just recede perfectly into perfect points, and it just doesn't have the, the clean, cleanliness, which is why vectors are almost always used for t-shirt graphics, for anything kind of really professional that's made to look clean. School mascots, images like that are always done as vectors. So just a review of raster. Rasters are made of square pixels. And then the more pixels you have, the more advanced and resolved they can look. But you can't get cleaner than a vector. 
So to do Mario in pixels, this is about the most simplified Mario there is. But to do Mario with vectors, first just a black outline, and then filling in each of those paths with solid color shapes, and then adding gradients on top of those colored shapes is how you get this kind of vector clean art. So Paper Mario, I, I heard Paper Mario, but it's really, once they were able to do some um, like higher resolution video games, they started bringing vector designs into it. And it, it brought video games back to kind of flat design, which was really interesting when it can have shadows and gradients. Now, vectors have two components to them. You'll be a little aware of this from what we've done with layer styles in Photoshop. But not only do they have the shape that you make that you can fill with a color, that's called a fill, but they also have a stroke, an outline that you can put onto them. And so you can have a vector shape that has one color outline and a separate color fill. What often happens with vector-based design now is you will create it with the outline, but then by the time it gets finished, you take the stroke off. You take all the outlines away. So here you can see how vectors start as just flat colored shapes. So this is black outline on top of like these stained glass vector shapes behind it. But then they can be augmented the same way we're going to learn how to do digital coloring for spot illustrations underneath those black lines. So coloring, when we talk about digital coloring, vector coloring, raster coloring, we're always talking about putting color behind an outline. And then sometimes we color on top of the outline. So how does this relate to logos? So there are different types of branding. So especially those in social media and marketing, you want to understand different types of logos. The first type are called pictorial logos or sometimes called iconic logos. And they work without any text, right? And maybe they used to have text, like Starbucks used to have text around it and slowly they've taken it away. Nike used to have text that always went with the swish. They've slowly taken it away or only used the text. But all of these are images that don't rely on any letter forms at all to show their identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, they keep simplifying it. They keep kind of bulking it up, zooming in on it as it becomes more familiar, right? So those are pictorial logos. Logo types are the exact opposite. Logo types are visual designs of letter forms. So Coca-Cola is probably the most famous logo type. But there are just others you don't really think about, like Subway, Visa, Walmart, Best Buy. These aren't just letters. These are arrangements of shapes within a certain position that really is meant to brand and help you identify the, the entity, right? Google is a very famous logo type, Disney. And then sometimes they are combined, right? You can put a logo type together with an icon or with a pictorial logo. So there's the old, the oldest Starbucks one, which was, I, I think, on um, cruise lines. It was coffee for cruise lines. So they wanted this idea of this Celtic goddess of the sea and in a porthole, like in a, a ship's porthole, right? And it's been refined over time. And then Nike hasn't changed much, except they've been able to drop the the logo type, and sometimes you'll only see the logo type. Same things with the Apple. <laughs> now, now you just see the Apple instead of seeing the logo type with it. Yeah. So it, it's a lot of fun with these really, really simple logo types. You can do variations on them. You can do critiques of them, which can be a lot of fun. So how do you identify if you've done a good job on your logo design? Right. This is not a design class. This is a digital art class. I'm just introducing you to them. But for logo design, it's all about immediately communicating something without asking the viewer a lot of questions. That's not always the same definition for fine art, right?
But good logo design is clear, it's engaging, and it's versatile. And it can take a lot of work to get to something that's clear, engaging, and versatile. That means it's really simplified and really, really effective without being overly fussy. And so there's a lot more sketching usually involved in professional logo design. And the average cost of a logo design for a corporation, for a major corporation, is around $100,000. And uh, a subset of Dell Energy just did one for their solar division. And it's a big bid and it costs that much because there are so many different subtle sketch variations that go on in the process. And it can take over a year for a design firm to put together. So we're just doing it quickly, right? So how do you sketch without making hundreds and hundreds of sketches to get it just right? How do you kind of use all of the different uh, approaches to logo design and really come up with something that's effective? And I think I've not been recording this whole time. Let me see. Oh, I am. Excellent. Good. <laughs> I got a little freaked out. Okay. So here we have what I think. This is my, I do a fair amount of logo design, but it's not my primary profession. I am primarily an illustrator, not a graphic designer. But this is how I approach it. It seems to work for me. It's helped students in the past. This is how I've broken down the three major approaches that designers use for, for icon design. And we are doing pictorial logos here. We are not doing logo types. We're going to be designing type and text later. So we are doing it based on icons, on images alone. Just like these examples, except for USA. <laughs> right? So central symmetrical is probably the most common type of logo. It works as branding like a cow brand. You know, it's something immediately identifiable. It's meant to bring your eye into the center and to hold it there. So Target is a wonderful example of that. But all of these are central symmetrical logos. It does not mean that it has to be perfect symmetry, right? Like the, the NBC Peacock, it's symmetrical because it's balanced off of the middle. Even though there's a little triangular beak on this side and even though the colors are different all the way through, it holds your eye towards the middle and is balanced. In central symmetrical, you're going to see a lot of circles. You're going to see a lot of horizontals, a lot of verticals, a lot of very stable static shapes because they're meant to hold your eye. The next approach is dynamic, and I want you to sketch both ways because they feel very different. And dynamic, like Twitter or Nike or the Rolling Stones, or this was for the Rio de Janeiro Olympics, it's all about moving your eye through the image. It's going to avoid horizontals. It's going to avoid um, verticals and it's going to avoid perfect circles because it doesn't ever want to trap your eye instead it wants to move it through so diagonals and curves are the way to kind of move the eye through whoops and then a play with positive and negative space sometimes can be central symmetrical sometimes can be dynamic sometimes can be a mix of both but this is really thinking of it as cutouts of black paper and that you can have a different pictorial image in the negative space as you can in the positive space. So this is for a zoo in Germany that's pretty clever. So they have the, the green elephant, but they cut out of it the giraffe and the rhino. A USA, the USA Network's a really famous example, even though it's a, a logo type, which has type in it, it makes the S completely out of the negative space. I like this key. It's a very second read, but it has the city skyline in the negative space. And then I put the, I think this is the World Wildlife Foundation, but I put this panda here because a play with positive and negative space isn't always so literal. Like, oh, there's a city in the white and there's a key in the black. Sometimes it's just making it kind of ambiguous and making the, the empty space have weight to it, right? And what this panda logo really does is by keeping the shapes open, it really gives weight to the, the empty space, which is can be incredibly powerful. So this is a pretty sophisticated way of dealing with minimal design. I In these slides, I do give you some tips to using Illustrator because it is a different program, a different interface, an older program, and it can...